130 years ago, ACAC began with a fervent commitment to run errands for the Holy Spirit, and we have continued to run ever since. But it has not been through the strength or giftedness of pastors, staff, or congregants that has brought us to where we are today. It has been, and will only ever be, by His Spirit. Our DNA makes us a church that is not only Spirit-led, but one which pursues God's presence and proclaims His truth, loves people where they are, is a diverse community of faith, and strives to be more like Jesus. This is the blueprint of ACAC. It's the very essence of who we are. Well, good morning, ACAC family. And again, welcome to those of you joining us online. Can we give it up for our online guests today? (laughs) Wherever you're joining us, we welcome you. As Pastor Allen mentioned, my name is Christian Ballinger. I have the privilege and the pleasure of serving as worship pastor here at ACAC. And for that reason, I am so excited to continue in our series today on RDNA by highlighting its second marker, the second marker of our DNA, which is that we pursue God's presence and proclaim his truth. Everybody say that with me. We pursue God's presence and we proclaim his truth. The reason why it's so important that we all verbalize that is to put to bed some misnomers that you could be tempted to believe upon hearing it. The first, that we pursue God's presence and proclaim his truth, simply describes our service order. While it's intentional that we start our service with a time of singing and seeking God together, and yes, typically later in the service, we hear the word of God proclaimed, that is not the essence of that statement. Furthermore, that statement is not insinuating that the pursuit of God's presence is the job of the singers and the musicians that serve weekly, or that the proclamation of God's truth is merely on Pastor Allen or any of our other pastors here at the church. Rather, what this statement, this second marker of our DNA is describing is our congregational calling meaning that we all partner in pursuing God's presence and proclaiming his truth together. And furthermore, I would suggest to you that a worshiping community is a witnessing community. What do I mean by that? Well, how many of you in the room are sports fans? By show of hands. Everybody roots for the Steelers, so everybody's hands should have went up, but that's all right. (laughs) So if you espouse to follow a team, but you never show up to a game. You never cheer for that team. Nobody ever sees you wearing any swag. You're gonna be hard pressed to convince somebody that you follow said team. For me, my favorite professional sports team of all time is, drum roll please, the Detroit Pistons. Everybody say, oh. For multiple reasons probably. One, I didn't say a Pittsburgh team, and I've been living here almost three years now, but you guys don't have a basketball team yet, so I can take some liberties with that. And then secondly, because if you follow professional basketball, you know how bad of a team they've been for like the last 15 years. So if you did not see this picture that you're seeing right now, you might not believe that that's actually my favorite team. But I got the t-shirt and the coffee mug to prove it. Somebody say amen. You don't don't have to say amen to that. But of course, me and my family, we have been here in Pittsburgh almost three years. So I've learned a thing or two about being here. And the one thing that I've learned is, look, you might not root for the Pirates. You might not root for the Penguins. But you got to root for the Steelers. Come on. You got to have some Steelers swag. Go Lions. Listen, listen, listen. You're going to be having a difficult time convincing somebody that you follow a team and they never see you go to a game. You never cheer. 
they never see you in any of that team swag. And similarly, our followership of Jesus is evidenced by our passionate worship of him. A worshiping community is a witnessing community. And in Acts 13, which is where I want to draw our attention today, we find one such community. Acts 13, verse 1, Luke, who's writing this church history that we have in the Bible of the book of Acts, he writes this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This early faith community, which is the first Gentile church or non-Jewish church Acts documents, was a diverse community. What's the proof of that? Well, there was, first of all, diversity of gifts, as Luke tells us, that there were at the church at Antioch both prophets and teachers. But then there was ethnic diversity, as there were both Africans and Jews in this congregation. Simeon, who was called Niger, that word Niger means the black. It's supposed to indicate that he was of African descent. So there were both Africans and Jews in this congregation. And lastly, there was diversity of backgrounds. Saul, who we all now know to be the Apostle Paul, which I'll get to later, was a former Pharisee, which meant that he would have been a man of the synagogue or the synagogue party. Barnabas, a Levite by descent, would have been a man of the temple, of the temple party. There's some subtext there. Manan, perhaps the foster brother of Herod, if that name sounds familiar, is probably reminiscent of Christmas time when we talk about the stories of Christ coming into the world, in particular Matthew's gospel. That family that was in the palace, Manan was a close associate of them. He would have been a man of the palace. Yet you see all these differences converging to form this diverse community that we find in Acts 13. And it was when these Jesus followers sought the Lord together that they were on the same page and moved in the same direction, which is that of following the spirit of Jesus. Suffice it to say, brothers and sisters, that if we are going to fulfill our mission of following Jesus in diverse community, that will be undergirded, that will be sustained, that will be strengthened by our times of corporate worship, which are essential to us being able to follow Jesus in diverse community. But these times of gathering together like we are this morning are not meant to be conducted out of mere routine or religious obligation. We are not simply supposed to just come and go but we're to enter in and be sent out, which means that our gatherings should be time spent in the presence of the Lord. This is what Peter, in Acts chapter 3, he's preaching the gospel after he and John perform a miracle at the temple. They have a captive audience now, and he preaches the gospel to them, and he says this, Acts Acts 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So as Peter is preaching the gospel, he says to this crowd, That if you repent, that if you turn, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, that you can expect three things. One, 
that your sins will be blotted out, is what we just celebrated at the Lord's table earlier. Are you, are you glad that Jesus Christ washed your sins away at the cross by spilling his precious blood? He cleansed us. The record of our sins is no more because of what Christ has done for us. So Peter addresses the past. He addresses the future. He says, this same Jesus that died on the cross for you and for me, that we could be forgiven every sin that we've ever committed, he is not going to stay where he is, but he's going to come back and set things in order. Peter addresses the past. He addresses the future, but he also addresses the present. And what God promises are times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. For Peter, brothers and sisters, this was the gospel. That God loves us so much that he desires for us not to run ragged through this life. Not to be weary, not to be worn down, but to be refreshed. And this means of refreshing is his very presence in our midst. As sure as we can be as sure as we are about the forgiveness of sins, as sure as we are that Jesus is coming again, we can be sure that God desires to refresh us in his presence. But here's the thing. God's presence must never be presumed, rather always pursued. God's presence must never be presumed, rather always pursued. You and I both know that nobody likes to be taken for granted. If you're married here today, you know the last thing that you should do is take your spouse for granted. Husbands, let's talk for a second. The same game that you laid on her to get her to the altar is the same game that you need to lay on her after the altar. We need to continue continually and intentionally sow seeds of love, affection, and appreciation. The wives should be shouting me down right now. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Somebody needs to be scheduling a date in their calendar right now because nobody wants to be taken for granted. And if our covenant as husband and wife needs those seeds of intentionality sown into it to keep the fire burning... Our covenant with the bridegroom deserves that same intention and much more. Let us never presume the presence, rather always pursue the presence. Furthermore, there was actually a church. We actually find a church in the pages of Scripture who was a culprit of what we're talking about right now. Presumption. We find them in Revelation, the third chapter. John, the apostle, write seven letters to churches in Asia Minor. And this church is the last recipient we find in Revelation, the third chapter. These are the words of Christ directly to this church. Revelation 319, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent, which means there's an issue. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, while those words are familiar to a lot of us and they bring us assurance of Jesus' desire to have fellowship with us, what is principally being conveyed is there is a church that was perhaps meeting every Sunday and Sunday after Sunday, Jesus is knocking on the door hoping, desiring, craving for somebody to let him in. And while we don't know, Scripture does not record the response of this church to this letter, we have an opportunity today, everybody say today, yes. to ensure that this will always be a place where he is welcomed. A worshiping community is a witnessing community. But in our efforts to reach our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, our city, our nation, our world, let's not forget the order in which our second DNA marker appears. We, one, pursue God's presence. 
and two, proclaim his truth. I offer you today that presence propels proclamation. Presence propels proclamation. We cannot read the Bible without running into this irrefutable truth. In fact, if you turn to page one of your Bible, you will see this in the creation account. Genesis 1 reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Even as God himself was creating the world as we know it, before we hear the words of God as recorded in Scripture, we see the Spirit of God hovering. Presence propels proclamation. As you fast forward into the biblical narrative, till the end of the time of the judges and the beginning of the time of the kings, Samuel emerges on the scene. And in his call, we see this principle as well in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord. In the Old Testament, the temple was where the presence of God dwelt, where the ark of God was, which was the visual representation of God's presence. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he, Samuel, said, here am I. The man who would turn the tide spiritually and lead a revival for the nation of Israel, who would crown Israel's first two kings, his call, his ministry of proclamation began in the presence of the Lord. Presence propels proclamation. Thirdly, and there are so many examples We come back to our earlier text in Acts 13, the call of Paul and Barnabas. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The intended launching pad, catalyst, origin of proclamation is the presence of God. Presence propels proclamation. And the reason why God designed it such way is that proclamation from presence brings transformation, not merely information. It's when a person gets a hold of God in his presence and then is sent out into the world with a powerful ministry of proclamation is when transformation takes place, not merely an exchange of information. You see, we live in the information age. If somebody really wants to know what the Bible says, they don't even have to come to church anymore. They can ask chat GPT. They can ask Siri, what does the Bible say about X, Y, and Z? And at the risk of you thinking that this was the case today or that this ever is the case from this pulpit, you can literally ask chat GPT to write a sermon on such and such passage, on such and such verse, on such and such topic, And quicker than any person can write a full message, chat GPT, AI will do it for you. However, while that's possible, it's just information. Nobody's going to be transformed by that. In fact, the Apostle Paul understood this from his time in the presence in Acts 13 when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. 
For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. I didn't come just giving you information. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. As you survey church history, you'll find many names who fit in this category. And one of those names is John Wesley. He was a famous evangelist in the 18th century and was the founder of Methodism or the Methodist Church. And in a book entitled Deeper Experiences of Famous Christians, we find a little bit of John Wesley's biography. I'm going to read it to you. We learn from his journal of October 15th, 1738, and again from the entry made on October 3rd of the same year, that Wesley had a great longing for a still deeper experience. I was asking, he says in the latter entry, that God would fulfill all his promises in my own soul. His longing seemed to have been satisfied, in a measure at least, in a memorable love feast in London, when he and Whitefield and other prominent Methodist ministers were present at a union meeting of the Methodist societies. Describing this meeting in his journal, Wesley says, Monday, January 1st, 1739, Mr. Hall, Kinchin, Ingham, Whitefield, Hutchins, and my brother Charles were present at our love feast in Fetter Lane with about 60 of our brethren. About three in the morning... So this was an all-night prayer meeting. As we were continuing instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we recovered a little from the awe and amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Wesley must have received a powerful anointing of the Spirit at the time mentioned above. As after the experience described, he seems to have preached with greater power. The Methodist societies now began to multiply rapidly, many souls being converted to God. For John Wesley, one of the greats of the faith, who was ministering before what we just read, The presence of God was transformational. There was a before and an after to Wesley's testimony, and a powerful encounter with God sits in between. It was transformational for him. And even when we look at the Apostle Paul's journey from Acts, the 13th chapter, we find a trail of transformation. First, we see that as Acts 13 calls him Saul, If you find him later in scripture, he's known as Paul the Apostle. You see, before anybody can receive transformation through our powerful ministry of proclamation, rooted in presence, we must first be transformed. And that's something that God does and wants to do in his presence. Maybe you're here today and you have some regrets about life thus far. Maybe you look in the mirror and you're not satisfied with how things are shaping up. Maybe you have even battled addiction or likewise in your past. God is able to transform you in his presence. He wants to do that, brothers and sisters. Transformation is first personal. But it doesn't stop there. We see in Paul's trail of transformation generational transformation. You see, while he lived a single life, while he never married and had biological children, we find that he adopts Timothy as a spiritual son and he imparts the faith to him and Timothy in turn imparts the faith to others. But it all started in the presence of God. Parents, can I give all of us some advice in the room today? Let us be men, fathers. Let us be women, mothers, who are marked by the presence of God. 
that even if you have a child away from the Lord, because of your security in him, because of the steadfastness that the, that the nearness of God produces, you're unmoved. Our children need parents that go and get a hold of God and encounter him in his presence. You can clap for that. Amen. So there's personal transformation, generational transformation. Then there's regional transformation. In that first, in that inaugural missions trip that Paul and Barnabas take, their second stop, Luke the writer records that the whole city of Pisidian Antioch came to hear the word of the Lord. What would it be like if Pittsburgh's restaurants were empty on Sundays? If their bars were empty on Sundays? Because everybody was coming to hear the word of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is responsible for transformation on a citywide, on a regional level. And let this be a church so marked by his presence that we see God transforming our city through us. Amen? Amen. And then lastly, there was international transformation. As Paul would continue on this missionary assignment from the Lord and eventually land in Thessalonica, which if that sounds familiar to you, are books of First and Second Thessalonians that Paul writes are to the church in this place. And even though they experienced trouble, even though they experienced turbulence, what came out of their opposers' own mouths were, was the following. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And it all started in Acts 13, maybe in a service just like this, where God laid his hand on Paul. He transformed him. He gave him something that was transformational to the next generation, that was transformational to the city, to the region, and that spread through the entire world. The sky is the limit for how God can use someone that spends time in his presence, because presence propels proclamation. I want to end by asking and answering two questions, the first of which is a two-part question. What is the presence, and how do we know we have it? We'll simply say that the presence of God is the Holy Spirit with us. I can't take credit for that. An African bishop named Dag Hayward Mills so simply described this notion of the presence with those words. The Holy Spirit with us. You see, while the Holy Spirit lives in each child of God, Romans chapter 8 says, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to Christ, which makes the opposite true. If you belong to Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ. While he relates to us that way and subsequently anoints us to be used for his special purposes, he desires to make his presence known among us. This is what Paul writes again. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There's a book that I recently read that I couldn't help but steal an excerpt from this because it said it better than, than I think that I ever could um, from His House, His Presence, which was written by Michael Miller, the founder of Upper Room Ministries in Dallas, Texas. Listen to this brief excerpt. The universal omnipresence of God and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit are different from the manifest presence. The manifest presence of God is an external reality, an outward expression of his nearness, best described by Jesus in John 14, when he said, he will remain in you and be with you. The with you presence of God is the external manifest presence of God around you. All these expressions are real, biblical, and true to God's nature and character, yet there are unique differences to all of them. Specifically, in the atmosphere of the manifest presence of God, the Lord is tangibly perceived. This experience moves us beyond the theoretical reality of his omnipresence to the transformational reality of his being present, in person, with thoughts, 
feelings, words, ideas, and action. This is not a universal reality always happening, but a selective one initiated by him at a specific time and place. Not always, but there is usually a level of intentionality and desire to encounter the presence of God that invites him to manifest. Through praise, worship, and prayer, we become aware of his especially near presence. He moves from being an otherly and almighty king to a highly personal and near father, comforter, and counselor. He is no longer an abstract idea, but a supernatural reality that we can sense, know, encounter, and engage. A.W. Tozer, in his classic treatise, The Pursuit of God, explains, the presence and the manifestation of the presence are not the same. There can be one without the other. God is here when we are wholly unaware of it. He is manifest only when and as we are aware of his presence. This awareness is our greatest need today. If it's true that this presence of God is our greatest need today, how do we know if we, quote, have it? We know the Holy Spirit is present when he manifests. When there is a sense of his nearness that can only be best explained at the heart level. Not something that is intellectualized, but something that is encountered because he is making himself known in a real way in our midst. Which leads to the second question. How do we pursue his presence? If we're gonna fulfill our calling as a congregation to pursue God's presence and proclaim his truth, how do we pursue his presence? And I'll insert this here, that while the thrust of our conversation today has been on the corporate level, uh, these next things that I'm going to share with you also apply personally. And I'll add that there's a great book called Secrets of the Secret Place by Bob Sorge that I would recommend to you if you want to go deeper in your devotional life. But with this time in mind, Acts 13, 2 has an answer to our last question. How do we pursue his presence? The first thing is to simply show up. Everybody say show up. Hello. Give yourselves a hand. Congratulations. Step one is complete. You got to show up. It doesn't say for no reason in Hebrews to not forsake the assembly of yourselves. Because there are things, yes, God has met me powerfully on my own. But there are things that he reserves when the they come together. You got to show up. The next thing is seek God. Everybody say seek God. Yeah. You see, the they were worshiping. It wasn't just that they came to church, that they said, okay, I'm here, so like God's going to give me credit for that. Or I'm going to go to church to see my friends and, and to have a good time with the people that I love. And while that is very much a part of being the family of God, when we gather together in this fashion, there comes a certain point in time where our neighbor disappears, where our kids disappear, where our spouses disappear, and we have a singular focus of seeking him. But it's not just showing up, it's not just seeking God, but it's also sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. Almost done. So while show up, while seek God, while the they and the worshiping of Acts 13 too, you can use that to characterize a group. How many of you know your neighbor can't fast for you? There is a measure of sacrifice that implicates us personally. Maybe for you, maybe you have perhaps an issue with getting to church on time. And I don't have anybody in particular in mind of saying that. Just throwing this out there. Maybe a sacrifice for you could be of 30 minutes of sleep so that you can make sure that you're not hurriedly rushing into the door, but that you're coming in fresh, ready to meet your master and your king. Or maybe you get here barely on time and you look at the well and you're like, man, I really want to get a cup of coffee. Maybe you postpone getting that cup until after the service so that you can come in and not be distracted 
so that you can seek God without restraint. Two more things. Save him a seat. Everybody say, save him a seat. If you're like me and you have kids in the kids ministry and you're married and you come to church together, maybe a technique that you have is divide and conquer. You go drop the kids off while you go get a seat in the sanctuary. Some of y'all are like, oh, that's a good idea. We should start doing that. Maybe you do that, and maybe it's a room like this that's full of people, maybe even a little fuller, and the peer pressure that you have for holding on to that seat, the usher that keeps coming back and saying, hey, is this seat taken? You are gonna hold on to that seat because you're expecting somebody to come and fill it. Brothers and sisters, may that be true of us when we show up, when we seek God, when we sacrifice, that we're not doing it for pursuit sake, just to say that, yes, we really pursued God today. We had 100% participation. Everybody lifted their hands. Everybody sang the songs. It was great. No, but that we're actually expecting that he's going to show up and fill the seat that we have left vacant for him. With this last thing, I'm gonna ask you to stand. Yes, we need to show up. Yes, when we come, come with a heart to seek God. Yes, pursuit of God's presence implicates us personally. There's some sacrifices that we're gonna feel in order to optimize our pursuit. Yes, we need to save him a seat. We need to expect that he's gonna show up. But when he does, he needs to find a surrendered people. You see, I don't know if Paul and Barnabas ever had plans of being world-traveling missionaries. But when the Holy Spirit showed up and said, set them apart for me for the work that I have called them to, the only thing we see is obedience. If God is gonna show up in our midst in the way that I know that we want him to, he has to know that there's nothing off limits. That if he wants to call me to be a missionary, Lord, send me, I'll go. That if there is an apology that I need to issue to somebody that I've wronged, Lord, I'll do it. When he comes, he needs to find a surrender people. I'm gonna do this. Prayer team, why don't you come forward and stand in the front, please? We're gonna dismiss. But as they're doing that, can we all lift our hands in this posture of surrender after we've showed up with hearts to seek God, to sacrifice, to save him a seat? Let's surrender to him in this moment. Father, we are available to you. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture, and we want you to satisfy us with the water that you desire for us to drink. Would this be a place where you are always, where you are truly welcomed? May your presence, O oh God, fill this mighty dwelling place. Be among this people in such a way that powerful proclamation takes place that changes our city, that changes our families, that changes our neighborhoods, Lord God. We don't espouse to do this on our own, but God, we come to you. All good things come from you. And Lord, we desire to enter in and to be sent out. May this be a place where you are always welcome. And we agree with this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's clap our hands for the Lord today. The prayer team will be down in front to agree with any of those who have a burden, issue of heart, who want to receive prayer for healing. But as for the rest of you, consider yourselves dismissed. God bless you and have an amazing week in his presence.